So we are starting a new series today, and so I want to start off with a, a comic. Uh, it's, it's a really old one, and it wasn't incredibly popular, but uh, it had some pretty good ones. It was called Sally Forth. I don't know if you guys remember it, but uh, it, was, uh, it was about a couple, and it was just kind of about family life, married life, and so forth. And so they often had uh, uh, situations where, uh, uh, you know, between the Sally and her husband, and here's one of them. Uh, so she's coming to her husband. They're, they're, you know, they're settling down for the night. And she says, Ted, do, do I have any little habits you find annoying? And he responds, I, uh, and then there's silence. Wait, I, I bet I know what's going on here. Uh, first, you ask me if I think you have any annoying habits. I weigh my options and decide discretion dictates that I say no smart husband. And then you say, as long as we're on the subject of annoying habits and out pours a flood of my shortcomings. Go ahead. Pretty sneaky, Sal, but I know what you're doing and you're using a subterfuge to bring up my annoying habits. She says, come to think of it, your habit of overanalyzing can be a little annoying. See, see, did I call it or what? I, I don't relate to this at all. I, I don't really understand the joke here. I don't know. Right? We, uh, we, we uh, don't like to have people point out our flaws, our shortcomings, our annoying tendencies, uh, let alone you get into more serious uh, character flaws or uh, deep gaps in kind of who we are, things that arise from out of our past or bad habits that we have picked up and built up. You know, it is common for us to go, you know, it's, you know, on the surface, it's at the very least rude to bring up such things to people, right? You kind of go, huh, all right, and we just kind of move on and, we, you know, we, we play nice and uh, you, you don't want to bring that up. And we do that in part as a social contract of going, if I don't bring up your stuff, you won't bring up my stuff, right? And if we do that, we can all get along. It's re really very helpful. Um, but today, as we start a new series called Dangerous Prayers, this is the very, ter very territory that we wanna go into. Often we think about prayer as a place of comfort, and certainly it is, you know, we have been stressed as a, people and as a society for the last several months. And I, I, I got a feeling that if there's a way to measure prayer, it was on the uptick here over these last several months. And just kind of a place of, of seeking out God and being reassured and comforted. And that, that's great. Another great thing about prayer is that, uh, you know, it's ways is, it, it gives us ways to fix other people because there's so much to be fixed. Can I get an amen? There's so much to be fixed in other people. And, and I can go to God with that. You know, why is my spouse? That's not my prayer. I'm quoting Eileen here. <laughs> you know, your kids, your boss, your coworkers, your neighbors. There's always something good to be praying for to fix someone else. Right? Or to turn a situation my direction. Because when we go to God, we go, God, I, I'm in this scenario and you, you've, you've got to deliver me out of this. You've got to bring an answer. You've got to open a door. Because what's wrong in this situation is in fact the situation. And, and you need to really kind of cause something to happen. Well, those are legitimate things of prayer, certainly. And that's probably where we spend a lot of our time. But we're going to go into new territory, dangerous prayer territory, dangerous because it's realms that we rarely go into and it is fraught with difficulty because it has nothing to do with anyone else and everything to do with us. But not in the sense of going, I want things to turn my way. It is us putting us at the center of what God is wanting to do. And so we're gonna look through uh, three different dangerous prayers over the course of these three weeks. Today, we are gonna look at a prayer that's very famous. It's out of uh, Psalms 139. It's an incredible Psalm. 
Uh, it deserves not only its own sermon, it, it deserves its own series. It's, it's probably one of the cornerstone passages out of the scriptures. If you've not read Psalms 139, you need to jot that down and go, I, I need to be reading that uh, and spending some time there. It's an incredible passage, and it ends with two verses of prayer. And we're going to stay there for today. It goes like this. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'm telling you right now, that's a very, very dangerous prayer. Probably should have the kids leave the room. This is like adults only. Only should be, be, be uh, uh, praying this. Because of what this does in terms of unlocking. And so we start off with this first call here of going, when we go to God, we go, God, search me. I want to really, really know. I want you to know what's going on inside me. Now, th this is actually a rather bizarre type of a thing, and we would need to look at the rest of the Psalms, and I'm not going to spend the, a lot of time here on the rest of this chapter, um, but Psalms 139 begins with, oh God, you have searched me and you know me. And the rest of the psalm is just laying out all the intimate, intricate ways that God is aware and knows fully everything about you. He knows where you, when you rise and when you lie down. He knows where you go and when you stay. He knows the thoughts in your head. He knows the words before you even say it. He knows all your days. He designed you. He created you. There is no aspect of your life that he is not perfectly in tune with. In some ways, it almost goes beyond it and says, you know what? God knows more about you than you do. You know, we tend to kind of go, I, I'm pretty in tune with myself. I think I know what's going on. Um, although we're guys, so guys can be a little bit clueless about ourselves at times. But we, we, we have this general sense of going, we, we know what's kind of going on, and we don't. There are times that we are confused about ourselves. There are times that we don't have a clear view of ourselves, And the psalmist has laid this out of going, God knows everything about you perfectly. And so he gets down to the end of this and all have already built this magnificent case of knowing that God has already searched out my entire life. He knows me incom completely he takes this prayer and says, oh God, I want you to search and know me. Is this prayer about God? Is the psalmist trying to get God to do something here? That's, that's normally what we think about as prayer, right? Me trying to ask God to do something. But that can't be it because... He spent the rest of the chapter saying, God, God's already done this. Complete job. Fully finished. He knows it all. So what type of prayer is this? What's going on here? Isn't this prayer about David, the psalmist, the writer, and when we pray, it's about us? It's not so much that uh, I'm asking God to do something he hasn't done, but I'm coming into tune with where he already is at and saying, God, I want you to open my eyes. I want you, I, I completely open myself up to you. That's not what we do. That's not natural to us. Um, you know, kids are pretty, they live in the moment. Uh, you get into teenagehood and you go through all that crazy stuff where, Everybody points out all your flaws, and man, it can be rather cutthroat. It was, at least was really cutthroat when I was going to school. Um, I got picked on a lot, but it's okay. I've forgiven them. I've got their names on the list. I'm just waiting for our class reunion. We'll meet out back. Say, remember me? No, no, I'm not doing any of that. Uh, they pick on you, and 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 so you know they they. They are all about trying to hide that. We become adults and we kind of come into our own. 
But really, adulthood is a lot of going, how can I minimize what's wrong with me and to the extent that I can't, that I hide it. And we do that social contract. I won't point out yours if you don't point out mine. Here, the spiritual truth, the spiritual path that we're being invited on is to go, I open the book of my heart and my life to you, God. I'm ready to be honest. What does it take to do that? It takes a lot of trust. A lot of trust. When Eileen and I first got married, um, we moved out to California. And you know how they talk about that first year as the adjustment year? We aced it. Because we're so wonderful and amazing. Really. That first year was great. No problems. No fights. Things were in order. Then we had our first year anniversary. And it was like a truck ran over us. And like the next month and two months, it was the wheels were kind of coming off of, not, not, you know, not that we were at each other's throat, but just kind of like things weren't working right. And I'm like, man, what's, what happened here? You know, I thought we were doing pretty well. I thought we've adjusted to life, living together and figuring this out. And then it dawned on me. For the first year, we were still trying to impress each other. After we got the first year done, (laughs) we kind of then started to let the flaws come up, right? The socks started to be left on the floor. The dishes didn't get always done. Just kind of eased back into who we really were, and we were having to come to terms with, with the real truth of it, right? Now, I did a very, very brave thing. I went to my wife and I said, here's what's wrong with you, honey. No, I didn't. (laughs) Although I did, I went, we had to go for a drive. We drove out into the woods. It was after church. It was on a Sunday afternoon. And I was like, we've got to talk. We're a disaster. And she's like, I know. (laughs) You know, and we, we kind of tried to talk this through. But it was really uncomfortable as a new husband of going, uh, I, I've never kind of brought up, you know, critiques of her or of me, and can we handle that? And that was a whole new place. We came to that place of going, will we search and know? And it requires that trust. So we, we throw out that word all the time here at church. Oh, you got to trust God. You got to trust God. Right here, right here is where trust becomes real. Are you willing to open this door of God's looking into your life? God, I want to know the real truth. I don't want to hide it. I don't want to cover it up. I don't want to pretend it's not there anymore. I I I want you to know me completely and, and for me to be part of that conversation. That's a dangerous prayer because it will take you to way new places. God's going, that's exactly what I want to hear. When we've done that, then we move on to the second part of this. It goes, he goes deeper. He goes, I don't want to just kind of point out some of these things, but I want you to test me and to see my anxious thoughts. Everybody's a liar. Everybody, even your pastor. I'm I'm sorry to say that. Uh, Now, we don't often lie to one another too much, maybe a little white lies, but you know who we lie to? We lie to ourselves. I don't eat that much. I cannot figure out how the scale could count that high, but I don't eat that. I I know I eat a lot, but I'm a big guy, right? I burn it all off. Uh, What happened to me? Scales, scales have just gone all haywire. God, oh God, please change the scales, right? Change my situation. No, no, no. I've got to come to a place of going, all right, what did I do? What happened here? Um, We look at our relationships, and it's easy to go, it's the other person, it's the other person. If they didn't do this, if they weren't like that, if they would change this way, boy, this would be really, really working. And we see it so clearly. But the psalmist knows. He goes, no, no, it's, 
This is about me. Test me. Put me under the microscope. So, you know, as I've been working with my kids uh, with uh, schoolwork here and, uh, you know, at times they kind of hit those challenging spots and they're like, well, you know, uh, you know, I've done all the homework, I've done all this, I really know the material. And I go, yeah, but what's the test score? Well, yeah, but I did all this homework. Like, yeah, that's great, wonderful. You're supposed to do that work. But the test tells the truth, right? The test tells the truth because either I know it or I don't. I can do the, the math operations or I can't. I know the content. The test tells the truth. And the psalmist is going, I want to come to that place of truth. Test me. And often where God uh, does this is where we've lied to ourselves, but he says, the things that reveal it are where I am most anxious. Fortunately, nobody's had this problem here anytime recently. Uh, so we're all in the clear. We could probably skip over this one, right? Isn't, isn't the way that we use prayer often of going, oh, I'm feeling anxious. God, God, come, come comfort me so I don't feel this way or fix the situation so I don't have to feel this way. And we get the complete opposite from the psalmist in this situation. He's going, I want us to go deep into my anxiety. I need to be honest about it. What has got me wound up? Because there's a truth here. What we fear, what we worry about, is really where we're at. There's often a spiritual issue behind that. To have a type of prayer life that says, I want to go deeper in. And I want to know the truth about where I'm at. Not the things that I've told myself, but where the real truth is about my life. Not how I'm just getting along, but how do you see it, God? Right? We grade on a curve. We grade, uh, as, as my friend Joe says, we judge everyone else by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. We give ourselves we grade on the curve, right? Well, I didn't really mean that, or there's a reason why I can be this way. The psalmist is saying, no, 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 no. Test me and see. I gotta know the truth. The third part of this then is he digs even deeper. He goes, let's go even past the anxiety and the fear, he says, now I want you to look so deep in. I want you to go to the places that I hope nobody finds out about, that nobody talks about, that I don't want to bring up. I want you to see so deep inside me that you see what may be offensive, offensive to you. When we come to a place in our relationship with God and we're going this is more than just about a moral code of going, okay, here's a bunch of do's and don'ts. But I come to grips with myself that really, you know what? I'm not as good as I think I am. It's a big lie that we tell ourselves. Yeah, sure, I have some flaws, of course. We're very quick to point out, hey, look, I'm not claiming perfection. But like the second part of that line, we don't say out loud, right? But I'm doing pretty good. I'm all right. I'm not as screwed up as the next person. Did you know what they did? Good night. I'm not as bad as that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm doing all right. You know who the most blessed person is? Is the person that no longer that no longer has the illusion of how good they are. This is exactly what Jesus ran into in his day and time. The Pharisees went, oh yeah, maybe we're not perfect, but we're pretty darn good. Better than those folks. You should be giving us props. And yet it was, say, the woman caught in adultery and brought, and they're like, you ought, to, you ought to stone her, right? Isn't that what's right? Isn't that what God really wants? 
He wants to deliver what we deserve. And Jesus goes, fine, but let's make sure we make this even. And the first person, without sin, casts that stone. Do you know how they left? Do you know the story? It says they left from the oldest to the youngest. It's because Wheel of Fortune was coming on. The old people had to, no. Come on, folks, these are the jokes here. The, the longer you go in this life, the more you drop that illusion of going, yeah, I got this all figured out. Yep, I'm really that good. No, no, I'm not. It's that woman that day that walked away knowing how great her need was, how broken she was. That was the one that got the gift that day. To come before God and go, look, this isn't just kind of like a tune-up necessarily. This is going, I want you to go to the places that are basically my blind spots, right? When we're driving, Ben's learning how to drive. That's one of the most dangerous places. You can know how to steer, you can know how to brake, you can know how to accelerate. It's the people that you cannot see, the situations that you think you are perfectly fine in and you are in extreme danger. To have a, a, a prayer life that says, God, I need you to show me my blind spots because I understand how dangerous it is. Our blind spots can get revealed with three questions here, three quick ones here. Or well, well, no, actually, before I go to that, remember, uh, uh, Paul talked about these blind spots, just in case anybody thinks this is an exception for them. I've, I've shown you this before. It says, as for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or frankly by any other human being. But here's it is. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My consciousness is clear, right? He's going, I, I, I don't know that I've done anything wrong, but that doesn't prove that I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine and decide because he knows the truth right down to the bottom of us. So let me ask you some questions. What are others saying to you? Now, you, you've got to do the, the appropriate community thing here, right? Because nobody's going to point it out directly. They're going to make some side comments. Unless you have developed a strong enough trust and relationship where somebody can point that out. I got there once in my life. I had a friend, Steve, at seminary. And our friendship was developing and, and getting deeper. And there was a point that I actually went into his room and I was like, Steve, you know who I am? W what are my issues? I I'm ready. I, I, want I want to deal with this. You say it and we're going to start, I'm going to start working on that. Never done that since then. <laughs> That's a pretty tough moment. Who's bringing stuff up to you? I'm not talking about one time or the people that might nag you, but something that's persistent. What have you rationalized for some time? No, no, that really isn't a big deal. No, no, there's a reason why that's okay. What have you rationalized? You got to work that hard to make it okay. Probably something's not okay about it. And what's the bottom one? Woo, where do you have a soft nerve? What ticks you off? I'm telling you what, that often reveals where we go. We know something's amiss. And you're pointing something out that I don't like to be pointed out. All these questions, this is not about causing guilt or dropping something on you of going, we're being invited to a place where we go, God, will you... Speak the truth into my life and show me what's off. His last part of this is then he turns and says, okay, guide me. Guide me into the way everlasting. I have 
lay, open myself up to you. I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to let you start to examine me and test me and really show the truth. And I'm willing you to go down to the very depths of my soul, the very issues, the very foundation cracks of my life and begin to expose things to me and show me these things, not so that you can bring judgment, not so that you can bring guilt, but that you can bring guidance, that you can fix things. Which homeowner is wise? The one that goes, I'm not going to go down the basement because I don't want to see how the, the crack in the foundation, how the wall is bulging in because I think it's going to be okay as long as we leave the lights off and I don't go downstairs. Or the one that goes downstairs and goes, oh, oh boy. And that probably is going to be expensive too. Oh boy. I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll just take out a few blocks and put a couple of good ones in there, right? That'll fix it. No, you got to call the expert. You got to call somebody that knows what to do and how to handle this. He's going, God, I'm going to you. I want you to deal with these things. And I'm ready to say yes. The book of Hebrews puts it this way. Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light. Don't pass off the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. This is stepping into a mature relationship with God where you go, it's not this God is a cop and he's come to catch me or God is a comforting blanket and he just kind of winks at everything that I do wrong and it's kind of an, oh, it's all okay and we'll, not, we'll just pretend that that stuff isn't there. This is stepping into a mature understanding and relationship of God of going, he loves me, he knows me and I can trust him. And the sweetest thing in my life is to receive that correction even, and in fact, I would say especially, especially when it's hard. Dangerous prayer. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me. See where I'm missing the mark. Look at where I'm anxious, where I'm worried, where I'm afraid, where I'm angry. Find every spot that is offensive and out of step with you so that you can bring correction. Because I'm ready. I'm willing. I am ready for you to put things right in my life. Dangerous. Let's pray. Father God, you have some deep work you want to do in us. And Lord, we want to we want to just kind of go beyond any type of small little image of you, a distortion of you that doesn't really understand the depth of your love and how you want to bring healing and wholeness and correction and righteousness throughout our whole being. Lord, we ask you to search us, search us individually, to search us as a body, to make the adjustments that only you can make.